We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. And we're back with Liberty Nation's national correspondent, who also happens to be a farmer, lawyer, and pastor, Mr. John Clark. Now, earlier in the show, we were talking about how the uh, how the food production models have really become an industry and how that's, well, let's be fair, it's quite detrimental to soil longevity and overall general health. When you get ultra-processed foods, things tend to suffer. But now I want to approach the food issue from... Uh, a security perspective, if we may, John, uh, and talk about how America is getting its food now. Because it seems, and I might be wrong on this, um, that there's a reliance on imports over growth, which is strange considering how much land there is in the United States. What's your take? Well, with the 3030 project, I think it's called, they're setting aside more and more of our farmland, supposedly to protect the ecosystem, which makes absolutely no sense when um, well-managed farmland sequesters more carbon than forests ever will. Um, this is a fact. And so industrial systems are used to disparage and close down local rural systems. This is what's happening in Europe as well. And you raise the issue of getting food from further or further away and security threats. I'll use another historical analogy. Here in Vermont, where I live and my family have been for many generations, there's a history of agriculture. The agricultural industry here peaked in 1852 with the price of wool hitting a dollar a pound for merino wool. And if you had $9 a sheep, I got 60 of them now, that would be a lot of money in 1852. You could drive around Vermont, you could see the, some of the finest big brick houses. They have the date right on them, 1850, 1852. The market collapsed. So Vermont shifted to producing cheese and butter that it could sell to Boston. Couldn't sell milk because milk would perish, right? Mm -hmm. You had to take it by horseback or wagon. We, we moved tens of thousands of turkeys, hundreds of thousands of turkeys, walked them to Boston. Turkey we, drives, yeah. Right, it was, it was amazing. Actually, they'd stop at night, you didn't want them on your barn. It would collapse, right, all these turkeys. So this is a, a tradition we've forgotten about, but then as transportation improved, Vermonters started selling fresh milk to Boston, and that became our dairy industry to replace our wool dependency. Wool shipped very well, it keeps better than milk. Well, guess what? They, by the 1890s, the uh, railroad started opening up to Ohio and other places that have milder climates, flatter ground, fewer rocks, and they can make milk too. Vermont wasn't very competitive there. So our dairy industry has been struggling ever since. Now let's expand this to a national situation where modern technologies allow us to ship food further and further away, not just because of quick transport on trains, but because now we've harvested it earlier, we've sprayed it with some stuff to inhibit its hormones and keep it from rotting and kill the fungus. We can, we can extend its shelf life. We can ship it from further or further away. With globalization, with NAFTA, with other things, we've, we have created a, a, a really a wonderful bounty. I mean, I can get avocados from all over the world and in Mexico that I could never have gotten here just 20, 30 years ago. Bananas year round. I mean, we really do benefit from the wonders of this, but it is precarious and it conceals multiple levels of, of threat that are actually unprecedented and invisible, perhaps until they pop. So why am, we're getting our food further and further away also from China, where it's aside from issues of competitiveness, aside from issues of the economy and even land use, there is a, a vulnerability um, that the more we expand this in the name of profit, the more we have risks and dependencies that we're not really countering or considering, kind of like those hidden chemicals in our food supply that for years we thought, oh, well, if you can't see it, it can't hurt you. And that's why Wendell Berry has written and called globalization the greatest weapon of mass destruction ever developed by man, in part because it dissolves these cultures that are dependent, you know, everything from Mexican maize to, you know, all around the world, traditional peasant or other farming cultures. And here in the U.S., you know, even the, the Vermont dairy culture are, have all been the victims, by the way, of a system that highly subsidizes monocultures, billions and billions of dollars every year go to the industrial agricultural system. This is not a free market. Um, we could compete a lot better as organic or grass-fed farmers if the other side wasn't um, having the scales tip so heavily in their favor. So the more we expand um, internationally, if you imagine the Great Depression, my family did pretty well here in Vermont because they still had a lot of local food supply. They were subsistence farmers. Everybody had a pig or a cow. 
I don't know what you do in the large cities if you looked at 1929 and looked at today if something like that happened because our entire agricultural system is is unrecognizably um, changed and divorced from that uh, more local uh, thriving and nurturing system. And we don't reclaim it overnight when we've put everything to suburbia and asphalt. So that's, that there's actually, a, as you point out, there's almost like a, a series of potential pitfalls and any one of them could trigger a, a large food problem in the United States, the richest country in the world, could trigger a large food problem, a famine in the United States. And that's all these different uh, potential triggers. And they're not by themselves, individually, that unlikely to happen. So let's take, um, let's take one example. Let's do soybeans from China. Now, I, I believe that soybean oil is the the most consumed oil in the United States. Not necessarily, you, you know, you pour your canola stuff, but within the foods, which is the largest source of, of fats for fat oils for most people. Um, but those soybeans, they come from China, right? And so if China decides in an adversarial form, we're, we're not going to ship or we're going to hike the price to take advantage of your depression, uh, if you're in like a recession, sorry, not depression, if, if there's a recessive economy in the UK and they in the US, and they might try and hike this because it's an adversarial force. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the food, the highly processed foods that rely on the soybean oils to, to give them flavor, to give them substance, um, they won't be able to produce. And that means that a large chunk of American food, like I'm going to use the air quotes for that food, is taken out of the equation, which means that then have to, Americans then have to rely on the, the homegrown food. And, and that's being squeezed out in favor of the multinationals. Um, and the, these, as you say, these globalist enterprises that can ship containers of, of beans or different things across, across the globe, really, because of all the, 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 the new time unconstraints that they have. Um, and I guess I just want to finish up. So my question is, John, without getting too hyperbolic as I want to do, how close are we to a disaster like this? I don't know. It looks like Russia's on to it. Uh, since Crimea Spring, um, Putin has really in, in improved Russia's agricultural system. But you've mentioned just soybeans, and we also do produce soybeans, and those vary, and maybe we're better off not eating them. Um, but what about diesel exhaust fluid? without which we can't move our trucks. What about our container ship system? We have a lot of things we're dependent on China for more than just soybeans. So there are multiple, what about an electromagnetic pulse? What would that do to the supplies to your local grocery store in America? So there are actually, as you say, multiple facets of risks of which foreign production is merely one. Foreign distribution and getting it here may be the bigger problem. Mm. And China controls a lot of microchips for our tractors and the diesel exhaust fluid upon which our trucks run, which is made from urea. They held back fertilizer exports when they didn't have enough of their own food a few years ago. They could do it again. John Pa, thank you ever so much for being with us. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides.